Wonderful, everyone. So welcome. My name, uh, oh, I'll stop sharing for a second while I do my introduction. My name is Sarah Flynn, and I'm with the Center for Global Education. And we are an organization that is um, a charity here within Canada and the US. And we connect kids around the world using online technology to learn about the people and places they're, they're, they're engaged in in their classrooms. So we run sessions throughout the year um, on a variety of topics. And now I'm not an expert in re refugee crisis, nor am I an expert in climate change or, um, or bats. But we, I am, uh, I'm gonna admit someone from the waiting. Um, I am an expert in this sort of technology, I'm a pedagogical expert, you could say. And so our organization uh, uses online technology. We have a virtual classroom platform that I'll, that I'll introduce you to. And we use video conferencing such as Zoom to connect kids around the world to talk about what they're learning about in their schools. So if instead of uh, learning about Kenya or reading about Kenya, we encourage students to come to our sessions and connect with Kenya to learn about the impacts of climate change in their community. And we're, we're shifting the lens then of learning from learning about something to learning alongside something, learning with that, uh, that topic or that individual or those groups and, and together forming um, your ideas and your thoughts and your critical thinking. And so shifting that away from uh, a colonial sort of I understand or I know to a much more what we like to with the using the UN framework, the Telenoa spirit, where you have people sharing their own stories as a part of learning and engaging and, um, and increasing our, our knowledge. So that's the, the Center for Global Education. I'll go back to sharing my slides. It's always nice to have a have a face when you are listening and um, being introduced. Uh, so if anyone is interested here in introducing themselves, I would love to get to know you better as well. Um, you can always wave or write, again, write a chat. Um, and I'd love to hear where you're joining from. So in the meantime, again, feel free at any point to unmute and ask a question. Um, I wanted to use one of our, we have these uh, small projects that we run. I wonder if I can change my view just so that you can see both of us. Um, yeah, sometimes in this video. Nope, not in this one. Anyways, um, so in, in our programs, uh, we have a small interactions where we bring students together from around the world. And, and right now, especially, Teachers are, are exceptionally busy and exceptionally overwhelmed. And so we really try to, to guide our students through um, activities that we can allow teachers to come and either sit, listen and learn and leave, or an activity guide that goes alongside that's provided by our hosts and our, our, our um, sponsors for, for various events and, and help teachers guide them through these conversations. Some of our conversations are very difficult. Many teachers within Canada and, and the US and Australia or, or, or throughout the world might not know exactly how to talk about Indigenous issues or, or residential schools, if that should be um, the, the topic of the day. And, and so we help to provide them with expert created um, resources and activities that guide them through these conversations. Now I'm gonna use our platform and, and our, our um, our ways of working with, with youth as a, an example of youth empowerment and how to engage and reach youth. And, and though we run these series of these small um, uh, sessions, we also run something much larger. So whether you join us as a classroom or a student for, for a week, or you join us for our largest project called Decarbonize, Decolonize, um, we are engaged, um, in, so we, we run these lar a large project called Decarbonize to Colonize as well. And it is a model uh, for bringing to their schools from around the world to talk about these issues in, um, in a multi-month sort of process. Uh, this year, we, we have 42 countries that we are engaging in um, this conversation and uh, we'll be joining them together on October 1st is our launch, <clears throat> excuse me. And we are excited to, to, to use and share that program today as a model in which anyone or any organization is able to um, engage youth and, and really in, in, in a different and empowering way where they're sharing and learning from each other and growing through that critical dialogue. 
Um, oh, hello, Olivia is from the University of Kent and um, focuses on climate resilience. Amazing, that's so apropos of my conversation today. Uh, someone from uh, Galloway, Ireland and awesome and being based in Bangladesh. Awesome, we have an amazing school in Bangladesh that we work with. Oh, I love them. I was just on a video conference this morning. Um, it's 8 a.m. now and I was on a video conference at 5 a.m. with them uh, just with the time sh change, but they're wonderful schools from all those locations. So again, back to my presentation, the Center for Global Education, as I explained, joins youth around the world to connect around the places that they're learning about and the, and the issues that they're learning about. So we really do try to use this authentic connection with multiple viewpoints. So even in our large project that I'll be talking about today, Decarbonize, um, though it is a climate change based project, the underpinnings of this and all of our programming is really global citizenship. So though we're talking about GHGs and emissions and, and NDCs and all these um, uh, very policy and practice and legislative concepts and, and we're discussing them with youth and how we, we approach them in our local and our national context, what we're really talking about behind all of that is global citizenship. What does it mean? What does my position, what does it mean that I am joining this conversation from Canada? What does it mean to be Canadian? What does it mean to, to be responsible to, for my fellow citizens within the world and within my country? And so we encourage students to look at it from multiple perspectives. Who voices are, whose voices are being heard? Whose voices are missing from this conversation? What knowledges are we presenting and what are we not hearing? And so even though we might be talking about something very technical or something as small with our grade twos, we do a, a connection with Polar Bears International and we talk about polar bears. And whether it be that single interaction around um, polar bears, really what they're thinking about is how does my responsibility as a Canadian connecting to Churchill, Manitoba, where the polar bears are currently living, how is that connection different? How is that the same? And what are my different responsibilities than our, my fellow student who's joining along in this conversation from India? And so we really try to underscore that, that citizenship component and, and how we, we build and, and make those viewpoints and connections, especially I think in these times of much, um, well, I, I mean, I'm in North America, so I have a lot of connection to what is going down in the States and, and the rhetoric in, uh, that is coming through those, those channels. And, and so in, especially in these great times of political unrest uh, within our country and the relationship between our countries, it's important that we understand and, and learn to collaborate through these conversations. Um, we also very much frame all of our programming. So if we are engaging youth, it is not simply we are not bringing them in and asking their opinions or running a workshop with a focus group and then providing them pizza and sending them on their way. That is not, that is not our, our, our program. In some ways we feel like education without action is like food without exercise. It's actually bad for you in that if we are teaching our students and our, our young people, our children, to care passionately and deeply about issues, and then asking them to flip the channel to move on to an another subject next week, we're actually causing them harm. And so if I ask a student in my class to learn deeply and care deeply about residential schools and the treatment of Indigenous peoples in Australia or America or Canada or any number of colonial countries, um, and then the next week I'm like, that, I'm sorry, Ahmed, but we've moved on. We've moved on to another very important topic that I would like you to learn and care for deeply. But I haven't allowed him or her to, to heal from that learning, from that, that deep engagement, that I'm actually causing a form of harm because I'm, I'm teaching them how to flip the channel, how to learn about something and not, not engage in it enough to, to, to really um, mobilize that passion and then to flip the channel to something new, like as though we're watching Netflix or sports on TV. So, so there's just the minimal levels and it teaches them to, to switch that channel and, and, and they get that habit. And so all of our program is very much about come, engage, enrich, deeply, have conversations, but then also act. How do we make this transformational? And so that can be small. It can be small acts where we encourage them to do advocacy or education. Make an infographic and post this around your school. 
engage in join Twitter because kids today are not on Twitter. It's an old person game, but that's where all the old people are who are making decisions, who are, who are making these, having these conversations. So engage in that and, and challenge and put out your thoughts, put out your ideas and, and make that action, or it can be a larger action. And so in, in the project that I'll talk about soon, Decarbonize, um, what are you doing in your cities? What are you doing in your schools to make change? Now you don't have to, um, this isn't about, you know, like raising funds and flying to Peru and building a, a, a greenhouse. We don't need to change somewhere else. So let's reflect on what changes we need to do. Do we need to even something simply as um, ask our petition our school district to change everything to fair trade coffee so that those our friends in Peru have the money in which they can build their own greenhouse system or whatever they identify as their need within their community to make the change? And how do we shift those perspectives? How are we engaging youth in, in doing meaningful work um, and, and healing that learning so that it, education leads directly to action, which leads directly to, to gaining the skills and the knowledge they need to in this very dynamic um, um, global community. I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. Everyone's still got their camera off and the chat's still quiet. Now remember, if you don't want to un, un, un visualize your camera, cool, cool, cool. If you don't want to unmute your mic, totally fine. You're welcome to send a chat if you have any questions. I can talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> and so I will just keep going and going and going. But I would also love for you, I mean, I know all this. This is my, this is my stick. So if there's any point you're like, how would I do this for me? This is my situation. I would love some advice please interrupt. That's the Skillshare, is I want to help you really engage youth in the work that they're doing. When we started, uh, I'm diverging. I'm never going to get through all my slides. So that's my problem. I never get through my slides. Um, when we started doing this project, Decarbonize, okay, I'll start. Decarbonize brings together students from around the world to work collaboratively via asynchronously on a virtual classroom platform that we've built uh, with the Canadian government so it's all safe and secure. It's like a Google Classroom or a Facebook for education. Um, and so they're collaborating on that, hundreds and hundreds of students from these 42 countries. Um, and then asynchronously there, uh, writing blogs, sharing artworks, doing video, all various different ways of representing knowledge that they're, they're gaining through um, shared collaborative activities um, with their, their classmates. And then also synchronously through video conferencing. We use Zoom all the time. Zoom, you can use in Bangladesh, you can use in Korea, you can use in Cuba, but other American, WebEx, um, Skype, uh, the other Google Meets, you aren't allowed to connect with those countries. Zoom is our, like our, our technology of the heart. We love them. Um, but we, so through Zoom and through this asynchronous tools, we, we bring them together to share their knowledges and, and their learning. And so they're learning alongside each other, learning with each other. There's, you'll see the, the collaboration that happens. And so all of this, uh, um, when, we, when we first approached UNESCO as a moral patron of our project, and, um, and we look, work alongside the UNFCCC, uh, the Framework for Climate, the Convention on Climate Change, which I'm sure you all know about because this is IAED. Um, so when we first started working alongside them, um, there was a lot of um, rules and regulations about minors coming to COP. Oh, I'm admitting someone from the waiting room. Welcome. Um, there was a, minors were not allowed on site. And so um, we've been working on this project in different iterations for about 10 years. Originally, we just video conferenced in and streamed some of the conversations and then had breakout groups and talked to the youth about what they heard, what they thought, what would they say back? And then we're like, well, why can't they speak back? What is the, the barrier there? Why do not we not want to engage the youth voice in these conversations? They can think complexly. They can recognize gray. It's not black. We often pigeonhole children as, as having black or white opinions, but very much all of our experiences show that when they speak and learn and hear from students in different situations, they can incorporate that and really work within those gray areas. Um, and so why aren't we allowing children and youth to share their voice? And um, there's been a monumental shift. I mean, I had a picture of Greta, just a few, I think you probably saw them a few slides ago, um, where, where there's been this really an opening of the door of 
youth are demanding to have their voice heard and they know how to use social media to, to rally. They know how to, to use um, WhatsApp and, and all those, uh, TikTok and all those groups to buy up all Donald Trump's tickets to his rally so they don't want to attend. <laughs> like they're engaged and they know how to use technology to their advantage. But how do we harness that into ways in which constructively they're working within the UN alongside the system, within the system to, to shift it from within? Um, because we do need that protest. We do need that. That is the way that change has happened, um, at least within North America, for many, many years. And we see that now with the Black Lives Matter movement. You need those urban um, uh, protests to, to uproot information, to, to create the moments of change, that then students can, can also, in different ways, come alongside and work um, systematically to, to shift large systems. Um, and so we were, we, we, very much, as you can see, I very much advocate for youth. And so we, in our conversations over the years, we've shifted um, those, those, uh, those conversations. And Uongo is a very strong organization. We very much support Uongo, but they are 18 and older. And so we, are, we really much advocate for that in these formational times in children's lives where they're deciding who they want to be, what they want to stand for. They're hearing their parents and they're, they're starting to branch out into their own thoughts and feelings and, and ideas. And, we want to, to shape them and allow them to have voice in this formational, transformational time of their lives as well. And so with our colleagues at the at UNFCCC and UNESCO and, and our other partners in, in this project, we really advocated for a space at UNFCCC uh, and at the comp conferences for, for their voice. And, and as of last year, we had 16 youth that were given passes and were able to come and, produ uh, and present at various side events. So, we, uh, one of our 12 year olds from, from the US ran and tackled John Kerry and told him what her thoughts were on climate change and policies in the US. And it was these amazing experiences where they really are advocating. They really are pushing for, for doable, um, realistic changes within their own communities and within global communities. <laughs> and who, oh, someone else. Hello, Janet, welcome to the conversation. Um, so this is, uh, yes, okay, let's see, on to my next slide. So this is my website, Center for Global Education. This is who I am. We have various calendar events and, and we welcome you to explore further our programs. Um, this is the link itself to our project that I'm talking about today, Decarbonize, Decolonize, as the model for how you can engage youth within your communities to do real substantial work, not just that focus group, not just that, that talk back, but how do we embed them within the systems of change? So again, this is our overall journey. You'll see our, our, our um, logo there on the side. And within Canada, this is produced by a, a, a local to me. I'm, I'm joining today on Treaty 6 land, which is the land of the, the Cree, the Dene, the Nakoto, Sioux, um, and many, uh, the Métis and many indigenous um, peoples who, who walked these lands before I. Um, and this was um, a, a local Cree artist heard of our project and designed this logo for us that was inspired in North America. The Cree peoples believed that um, North America was on the back of a turtle that was um, within the fabric of, of, of the universe. And so this is a symbol that, that recognizes that. And so there's the image of the turtle and then the branches out to all of the communities of the earth and the, the, the water and, and the, the, there was the substance um, the, on which the turtle was, was carrying North America. And, and all, anyways, this is a wonderful image that brings our group together every year. Um, these are the countries that are involved in our project. Oopsies. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to minimize my other things here. Um, so these are the countries that are involved in the project. I was just got uh, Czechoslovakia on this morning, so I added them to the PowerPoint, and I'm speaking with a few more countries. Uh, Morocco will be later today. I'm trying to get them involved. Um, again, oh, and so if you're here today, Ireland, ooh, I don't have a school from Ireland, and next year, COP, as we know, is in Scotland. So I would love a school from Ireland if you know, if you're, you're doing your PhD there. So if you know of a local high school or you're involved or your community is linked to one, oh my goodness, I would love to, to connect with you. Um, I'm gonna scroll up and, get, and see your name. Uh, Olivia, Olivia, I'm gonna send you a, a little chat here before the end <laughs> to see if we can scheme. But Tanzania, I don't have a school from Tanzania either. I would love to connect with the youth there. So. Remember my, my name, oh, you know what I'm gonna do before I forget, I'm gonna add my um, email to the chat here. 
sorry to interrupt my sort of ongoing ramble. There. Yes, so Ireland, uh, we, do, we do work with other, uh, so right now we are firmly, oh, someone wants to come into the meeting. We are firmly embedded within schools because we are part of the UNESCO school network. So our relationship with UNESCO has us work that, uh, quite closely with, with schools. Um, but with COVID, our, our, our access to other groups have, has expanded. So Boys and Girls Club of Canada well, um, and uh, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. I don't know if you, uh, other countries have these sorts of youth organizations where um, now with COVID, where many groups aren't allowed to meet in person, they have to meet virtually. And so we're helping to facilitate, well, you want to learn about polar bears? Come to our event at seven o'clock at night, uh, you know, and we'll we'll connect up to Churchill to a to a scientist, or we'll connect down to Antarctica and learn about penguins. Or um, very much a lot of our work is aligned with climate, but we do we we connect with to a re refugee camp in Rohingya to to learn more closely alongside refugees. And um, yes, so we we aren't. Uh, we are not solely focused in one area uh, of our relationships. We, we welcome all students or, and I, I say students, but I really mean youth um, or, or I guess not even in a UN sense of youth, I mean children and young people. I always have to change, shift my language because if you talk to children um, in grade 11, uh, which would be 17, um, and they can vote in their country and you call them a child, they often feel very angsty about that. So I'll say youth, but then when you talk to the UN, they mean over 18. Ah, oh, semantics of it. Um, so again, this is our, um, our pyramid of our, our program. We, we um, start with global, we have a global art gallery, which I will show you later some of the artwork that's submitted and hundreds and thousands of youth from around the world submit art um, to this global gallery and, and allows for us to, to think not ab only about conversations of how climate change impacts me on a personal level, if I live in Trinidad, that, that I see the soil erosion, but also what does it make me feel? And so our project is an English language based project. Um, we have opportunities for school to participate and pair with other speaking language speaking schools. So our Spanish schools will pair together Spain and Cuba and perhaps Peru and they'll work together um, in, in the language uh, of their choice. But um, we do not have like a Portuguese section. And so um, the, the conversational element is, is often in English, which can be a barrier. Um, but the but art transcends language, as does music, and so we encourage very much a part of the project is is for for youth and as well as age. It's difficult for four year olds to participate in a blog conversation, but they can provide us with their ideas of how climate ch change is impacting their days, which it is, um, and and share that with the world. So we have a, a, a global art and collection. Um, we also run a global youth survey that. Um, uh, uh, collects um, youth opinions on questions that our, our engaged youth design and, and deliver. Um, and that survey is translated into every language that's, that's represented on the project. And those students then send it out to their communities for, we, I think we had 13,000 response last year, which was built into our, our paper that we presented at the UN. Um, and then we have whole school projects. So we encourage schools that do participate that it's not just um, a biology class or not just the civics club or the, the law club, that, that they really integrate it throughout their school. So um, that decarbonize becomes um, a, a way of thinking about how am I enacting change in my communities. And then we have our lead synthesis. So those are the students that are directly engaged on our project, that are online, that are, that are um, working in blogs with other students, having video conferences across the world. And from at the end of our project, um, we, we invite one student and, or one chaperone and one uh, uh, student from each of the countries that are participating to come to the conference um, and, and engage in a five-day writing process where, they, uh, where we lead them through a co-authoring of the, the work that they present at the UN. So it's, we don't write it, the adults don't write it. It's a, a, a lead writing exercise where they create their paper and it's not transformational. It's not a new carbon capture system. They're not coming up with some new technology that no one's ever seen before. What they're coming up with is, or what they're doing is they're providing the moral license for, for, for interest groups and for their governments, because they meet with their individual governments, uh, representatives, they are providing that moral license to do the work that they need to do, to make the changes. So if the U.S. is, is, is wanting, well, I, I 
Okay, not the U.S. If um, if Canada is wanting to push through um, um, some sort of of change, then then having you come along and say, you know, thirteen thousand youth around the world support this call for action, um, that provides moral licensure to make those changes. Um, and so that is um, that's the, the the project itself launches in April on Earth Day with our art and our surveys. And in September, we introduce that whole school approach that I was speaking of. And then in October, we start our live interactive sessions. So October 1st will be our global launch that we'll be doing next week. And all 40 countries will be online. And it's adorable because the, the, the kids in Australia, it's two in the morning for them. And their school opens up the gym and they sleep overnight and they wake up and they do the video conference and then they go back to sleep and then they wake up and go to school in the morning. It's wonderful, sort of celebration of this amazing experience they're gonna have. And then through October, um, we lead to the local. So they'll do local sort of investigations of carbon, um, um, their carbon footprints, both of their schools and of their, uh, of perhaps a community group or of their personal carbon footprint in the current COVID age where some of our Argentinian friends are still locked within their homes. Um, they'll, they'll do a carbon footprint of their home and, and perhaps it's shifted since COVID and they're at home more. What does that mean? Um, and then we move into bilaterals where each of our global north countries is paired with the global south and they engage in a, a conversation between the countries and they look at a national case study. Often Canada, it's, it's um, our oil sands and perhaps if we're paired with Peru, it'll be mining. And they, they compare those and they learn what, whose voices are being heard, whose voices aren't, what are the changes that are being made? How can we, what are our similarities or differences in terms of action and, and advocacy that is needed? Um, and they have those conversations. And then in November, we'll move into our continentals. And so this enriches the conversation further and that each of these countries has been exposed to another part of the world. And then they come together and they talk about how is NAFTA implicated by this? What are the EU regulations and how do they implement? How are they implicated? What do we need to, what conversations do we need to have? What's climate justice? What's climate resilience? And all these sort of larger conversations. And then we move into global in December. And that's when we have a, our conversation that, that leads to the writing of the report that's presented at the UN. But also we have another celebration because they've been on this amazing journey and they've listened to music from around the world and they've seen art from around the world. And they've had these amazing, intense, sometimes very confrontational conversations where, um, oh, Someone named Sarah is joining. Welcome, Sarah. Um, where, where students will challenge their peers. So I know we had our conversation last year in Canada, and I was facilitating this amazing dialogue between um, kids up north in, in northern Canada, that, where the pipe, where the oil is extracted from the ground in Canada. Uh, it's in Fort McMurray, and then our other school was in Costa Rica, and they were talking about the mining. And, and so the Costa Rican children were introducing how there was militias that were being formed to, and decimating indigenous populations and the land, um, uh, uh, the, the pollution was, it was extreme and, and it was really um, shifting, making impactful changes to their climate that they could quantify. And um, so they're explaining this to the Canadian kids and the Canadian kids are like, that's awful. What can we do to help you? How can we help you? And the Costa Ricans were like, uh-uh, you need to, these are Canadian mining companies that are doing this. And it is because of Canadian laws that they are able to do this because um, in, in Canada, um, corporations cannot be held accountable legally for, for crimes they commit outside of the country. And so many American corporations have headquarters in Canada so that they can get into this loophole. And so the Costa Ricans are like, you need to go to your government and advocate for a change in this law. And the Canadians, the kids here, like one guy was crying and he was like, this is not the Canada I know. And, and the teacher was like, I told you this last week. What are you talking? But there's something about being called out by a peer, by, by watching a video of Manuela introduce herself, talking about the impacts of climate change, and then her in a conversation challenging you to, to address the policies in your country that are allowing this to perpetuate. And you see Manuela and you've talked to her and you've read her blogs and you've seen her art. And there is something about this intercultural connection that, that calls, that hearkens to them. Manuela, I am Manuela. I care deeply about these issues. I don't want Manuela to suffer. I don't want her relatives to be in fear of Canadian companies. And it's a different way of having these, these conversations, but then the, the call to action is great. And that Badar, who was the, the kid who was so impacted here, um, 
he's actually a university student now. It was a, he was in grade 12, he's in university and he's come back to the project as a student mentor. But he lobbied our local government to declare a climate crisis. And so the city that we live within declared a climate crisis and have come along board as C40, which is an American cities organization, to say that, they're, that, that despite our provincial government's denial of climate crisis, that, that we are actually in that point. And so it's amazing the change that, that can be empowered within youth to, to, to make these, these, because he knew that protesting, having a school strike wasn't going to impact the ability of Canadian corporations to, to mine in Costa Rica without, without any sort of consequences. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? I can go on tangents. So if you need me to rein this back in and address some of your comments, please let me know. Um, we do have a school in the uh, Philippines, St. Joseph's in Manila. They've been working with us for about four years. They're a wonderful school. In fact, their student was our global lead in Poland. Um, a brilliant school. Um, with tools that make the class interactive. Okay, so I'm going to get to that. So this is the bilaterals. It's sort of a diagram of this is our virtual classroom. And so I can actually take you on to the live one. Why don't I do that? Because it's so cool. Um, I was just in there doing some stuff a few minutes ago while, while I was waiting for this conference to start. So this is our live classroom right now. Um, only a few countries have logged on. There's about 100 kids um, because we don't launch till October 1st. And so, so, but some of the kids are just so excited um, that they've already gotten on. And you can see that, so the interactive portion of this is um, we are, their introductory activity is to, they learn about something, they learn about Talanoa, about sharing their stories, about why it's important. Uh, we encourage them to create um, an introductory video. Again, this, is, this isn't the, the, like the meat of it. This is the, the introductory sort of wonderfulness. And so, and then we ask them to post it. And so you can see here that some of our students in Brazil, Gabriela came with us to Spain last year and spoke. Um, uh, uh, some of our students have already posted their video. I won't play it because, uh, oh my goodness, that my internet would, would kill me. But, uh, but you can see that they're already online. And so what happens is students watch a video. They're very much encouraged to, in particular, watch their bilateral partner's video. And then they comment. I think I've actually commented here. Um, and so here, this is, and the, the richness comes from when they start doing, I wonder if anyone's posted a, um, a carbon one. So here they'll learn about climate change. They have some opportunities to, to engage in learning materials. Then they'll, they'll have opportunities to, to do their own carbon footprints, whether it be at home or, or in their school. Uh, there's an easy version and a complicated version. And then they'll have some guiding questions that their teachers or their scout leaders or their, their, their adult companions will take them through. And, and, or perhaps just in a Zoom call, they'll discuss these with their friends. And then they write a blog. Let's see who's written blogs. Ah, oh, we do have some blogs. Oh, our Australian friends. They've done a few. So this one was just posted a couple of days ago. I'm not sure if there'll be any comments yet, no. Because again, the classroom doesn't open for another two weeks uh, or another week anyways. Um, and so she's talked about um, her carbon footprint, um, what it makes her think about. Um, so I'm gonna try to do little things like turning off the lights. I mean, this is an introductory exercise. And what happens is, is students will, will start to think or will encourage them to think, um, okay, I'm in Brazil. And this is my carbon footprint. This is my Australian friend's carbon footprint. I've watched her video. She's very, she loves swimming too. I love swimming. We all go to swimming lessons. Um, what are my responsibilities? How are they the same? How are they different? How's my carbon footprint different? The GDP of my country is this. Does that make my responsibility higher in relation to my friend from Madagascar whose carbon footprint is lower? And so we start having these conversations and we post comments, bloop, 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 bloop. Uh, I won't post that nonsense but um, and and we and so if we went into the classroom from last year we'd have blogs with 50 or 60 50 or 60 comments sort of like a Facebook sort of post um, where people are having conversations and that's similar that's different that's not what I experienced that is I, I don't agree and this is why and they have these sort of conversations here and then all of these comments are what we use to, to build that final paper that we present. All these opinions, all these thoughts, all these areas of, of tension or of agreement. Um, and so we have the national case studies, they're, they're bilaterals, and then we, the, we talk about climate justice, and, and then we move to the continentals and the globals. But um, as you can see, there's, there's discussion. So like, let's make a playlist. What songs are popular? And then there's 
the uh, gallery. Let's show, let's show the art. Um, here are some of our art pieces that were submitted last year. And so these are from four-year-olds from our, our Peruvian school. And the, this was the whole school approach where they went out into their younger grades, their K-12 school in, in rural Peru, and, um, and they asked them to produce art. And then they shared it on the classroom. And we look at that, and what does it make us, what does it make us think? What are we seeing? What are we hearing? Even if it, the, the language is different and there's barriers in culture, what, how does this impact us in different and unique ways and make us think about these issues? Um, so tools that we may use, uh, thank you, uh, Leticia, for the, your question. So the classroom is interactive via for these asynchronous opportunities to share videos, um, to, to produce art, to, to do um, music, uh, to blog, and then to, to finally have these meetings where they come together um, and synthesize that information and really grapple with it. And, and yeah, all right, I'm going to see check to see if any other questions have come up. I think that kind of covers it, but if, if I've missed it because you've gone too far, um, uh, please just re-ask re or, or pipe up in your microphone. I do not mind people interrupting me. As you can see, I will just talk, talk, talk. Um, but I want you guys to learn what you'd like to learn about this project and how you can enact it in your own work. So yes, again, Eliza, we, we do welcome community groups. Um, we work, it's easiest for us to work with schools because there's a responsible teacher, but if it's a, a scouts or a guides or, or we have forest rangers in Canada, if there's a, a responsible forest ranger who then has the children that work out underneath him, as long as you have that adult to guide you along the project. We find our most successful um, sites are ones where there's an adult who, who, who touches base. We do have children who join around the world who hear about our project from their friends or, or just online Googling and say, I want to join, but they often um, feel alone. And so th the adult's role is to really help them feel and bridge that way into the community. Like, uh, you know, did you check out Sarah's posting Australia? She sounds like she's talking about the exact same stuff you are, Lisa, even though you live in Kenya. Does that make sense? I'm going to pretend you're all nodding. Ha ha ha. So. We have our virtual classroom, and as I showed you, that the, we have the videos and the blogs. Um, and then here is an example of some comments from last year where they're going back and forth and watching these videos disturbs me and confuses me. It doesn't make sense. Um, you know, and so, because this was about um, another topic. So I think this was about our refugees. Um, and so people are having these conversations um, and, and really sort of grappling with these ideas and, and how they can... Um, um, how they can make sense of them and what does it mean to be a part of something larger, not just about tackling climate change, but about being global citizens. Um, are primary age kids, 5 to 11, able to get age? Yes. Um, so our youngest schools is um, participating are age 10 and 11 um, and 12. So those middle years in, in Canada, um, uh, but we do have younger kids who, who participate through the art and through the music. Um, it, it's hard to get five-year-olds involved just because of the reading level um, and often the, the language barriers, but um, we love everyone to get involved. When we have younger um, youth, we pair them together. So our younger students from Canada are paired with a younger group from, from another country. Um, and if that makes sense, we really are very intentional in our pairing so that everyone gets the most out of it. Um, how do we replicate network like this for less technology? Yes, so our Cuban school, the students don't have internet access um, at home. The same with our Palestinian school. So they are not, um, the government doesn't grant them access to this only within the university. So our students actually in Cuba and Palestine have to travel to their local university that hosts them to, to, to access the classroom and engage in this. And so with those um, groups, we encourage a lot of offline work. And so they do have touch points of synchronicity, but we encourage them to record videos in their own communities on their cell phones. Um, many, many of our Cuban students don't have access to a cell phone and we have a provider who is sponsored. And so we're able to send a smartphone that is able to take um, videos, uh, capture videos. And then when they receive uh, are, are at their, their university sponsor, um, they are use, able to use the Wi-Fi to connect and, and upload those, um, but also just general cameras. If, if we can send them a camera, we will do so. And, and they record their journey offline. And then when they're able to upload it, they, they do so. I know it's difficult in the technology age to not feel immediately connected. Um, 
but we're trying our best to, to overcome these barriers in, in ways that we can um, because it is an, an online project. Um, of, of course, we're always welcome to recommendations as well. If you have something that's working in your projects and you'd love to, to share with us, um, we'd love to share our technology. Everything we do is free. There is zero cost for any of our participants in any of our programs. So the virtual classroom is free. Our global gallery is free. All of our resources and, and obviously Zoom is free. Um, and so we're always encouraging this as a model. This is how we engage youth around the world in this for us. But you can do it too. All of this is readily available for, for, for your organizations to reach out and engage youth in new and exciting and collaborative ways. Um, oh, we, we have WeChat because of our, our friends in China. We, um, yes, so there's all sorts of things. Um, I think I'm in my last few minutes here. This is a picture from one of our launches and you'll see that our school from Cuba and Taiwan and Latvia and Peru and Indonesia is here and Mary's from Kenya. We love our Kenyan school um, and Colombia. And so we have these amazing moments of celebration um, and, and community. Um, here's a, a, an image of our global gallery. So if you, you taking a global as our parent, um, our parent charity name. And Center for Global Education is the educational component. But um, you can see Decarbonize, we have this global gallery and there's hundreds of artworks that have been shared. Um, and, you know, the students can go in and be like, this is what climate change means to, to uh, this one is uh, from Taiwan. Um, let's see, I think I have some more. Uh, yes, uh, here's our art from some uh, of our Philippine friends. And here's a collection from Bangladesh. And, oh, I've, is this, uh, I've, have my zoom window in the way. I know this is a, a 12 year old from America submitted this beautiful whale drawing. And I think this is from our Kenyan friend, but again, I'm sorry if I'm getting it wrong. I can't read the bottom of my slide there. Uh, this was, uh, and here we were in Poland. Um, we were presented at both Koi and COP. Um, and then the, the youth action component. So I was speaking earlier for those who missed that everything we do is embedded in this idea that we need to inspire action that it's not enough that they learn it's not enough that they talk and we hear them they really need to to be given the license and the vehicle and the empowerment to to act and and action doesn't have to be protest um, because we know that for our, our schools in china that is a, a very difficult and, and scary prospect but it can be here we have children doing water testing at their local stream we have um, students doing all sorts of uh, real conservation um, focused action. And then for our students in Kenya, um, there were some protesting. That was what they felt their community needed. Every community needs different things and will act in different ways. And so here was one of our students um, providing a talk. She was talking about decarbonize. She was presenting what they had thought, what they had done, the journey they had taken. Here's our, our friends in Trinidad and they had, um, they're doing conservation based work as well and looking at um, their school garden, their school pools and, and how the, the, the acidific ocean acidification is leaching into their school um, food communities. So they grow their own um, food on site for their cafeteria and, and they were wondering what was happening there. And, and so as their action project, this is what they did. You know, within Canada and America, we've been able to align with organizations that provide funding for students for action projects. So it's not only that they have this idea, but they also give them funds then to act on it. So you need $200. Here is a way for you to, to measure your, here are your, the, the things that you need in order to measure that acidification. And we try to work with organizations if, if students are very much, so this one, UNESCO came alongside and sponsored them and all their, their nets and their buckets and their their, their tools that they needed in order to do this, um, we do try to provide that as well. Um, so what's our age range? Um, we have um, in Palestine, we're only allowed to work with university, um, within the university and the older um, levels of high school. So they've authorized us for like grade, the Canadian equivalent of grade 11, which is like 16, 17 years old to the first year university. But, and, and so they, they have a different sort of role in the classroom than, than our 11 year olds and our 12 year olds. So we do really sort of work within that. Um, the, the conversational elements are from the, the, the 11 to 20, but um, obviously all of our programs are cross curricular. We're within, we're within elementary, we're, we're all over if that helps. Um, but we do not really go above age 20 because then you have Yuango. You have these amazing organizations that are already working and inspiring in that age range. 
Um, oh, and here's our Ghanaian friends. And so uh, they are showing different ways, oops, in which those students were, were working and, and um, doing some action. Oh, here's all of us in Spain last year. We're at downtown Madrid hostel. Um, we have our students from Australia and here's a student from Kenya with our student from Palestine and um, our Canadian students and our Denmark, they're all, oh, those Denmark kids are very tall compared to everyone else. And so our goals, we're heading, we're transforming, we're always thinking ahead. Oh, I think I'm over in my time. So if you guys have to start shuffling out, I completely understand. But I'll just sort of end, I'm in my last few slides here, is our goals are to, to really take this more online. And we've been in the process of developing an app in which students around the world will be able to download and then log in and um, allow them and their schools or their community groups, whether it be their Girl Guide troop or whatever, to log their carbon and, and mitigation um, and the mitigation they've taken in their actions. So we have introduced solar panels on our school. How much carbon has that mitigated? Can we quantify it? Can we actually say under the decarbonized program, this is how much um, carbon um, and GHGs are, are mitigated? Um, and so we, we um, it's, it will try to have it there. The idea here in our, in our prototype is to have it, you can search by action, you can search by country, you, we will we'll have it quantifiable for, by, by community and by project type and all sorts of, and this is our, our next big step into the world of technology. And so uh, we like to have this Alice uh, as a sort of our, our closing thoughts. Um, that, that we want youth to, to oh, I'm going to stop sharing um, so that I can, you can see me anyways. I can't see you, but you can see me. Um, really, our goal in this is to shift the idea that youth aren't thinking that, that when will I talk to um, a student in another country? When will I meet someone from Kenya? No, not, not shifting these extraordinary things that happen into ordinary everyday things. I'm learning about, uh, I'm learning about the Serengeti. I'm learning about a certain type of wild, of, of flora and fauna. I'm learning about polar bears. Not if I'm going to connect with those, but when. So this doesn't become an extraordinary. This becomes the ordinary every day. They should be walking into classrooms. They should be walking into their girl guide troops, not thinking, oh, I wonder if I'll ever talk to someone from Australia. I wonder if I'll ever go there. But, um, but when will I? When will we be doing that? Is that next week? Because, because it's happening. You know, this is the power of our technology that we have and, and, and the ability of our organizations to help to coordinate this and to really enrich the, the learning and the experience and the development of, of our, our youth in their most transformational times. Oh, okay, I'm four minutes over. But I hope that you enjoyed my session. All of these tools are, are things that you can start doing today. There are ways that you can engage youth today. And if you would like one-on-one -on -one help, like, oh gosh, this sounds awesome. I want my organization to do this. Give me a call. Uh, I put, uh, I have my um, email above here somewhere. Maybe I'll type it again, quick, quick. So it's near the bottom. Um, so taking IT global, oopsies, I just put gonad, global, <laughs> oh, ORD. Um, here, there we go. Uh, but, and again, I'm the center for global education. Uh, and, and our uh, project name is uh, Decarbonize, Decolonize. So, I mean, Googling Center for Global Education, email me directly, reaching out through Decarbonize. I would be happy to, to give a couple hours and sit alongside you and brainstorm ways that you can do this with your organization. Um, the, these youth can be so inspiring and so empowering and give you such moral license within your own organization to say, this is what the kids in our community are calling for. You know, like this gives us the mandate to do our work. And so anyways, yay, go. <laughs> if you would like to do, um, and if you have any questions, anything like that, um, I am here and available and would love to, to chat with everyone. I'll open it up. <laughs> I just want to say, yes, there's still time, um, everybody, if you would like to ask some questions. So it doesn't need to be over here. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> I know too with these conferences, it's just go, 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 right? And so you just take in the information and then you think about it, you let it marinate in the back of your brain. And then two weeks from now, you'll be like, I want to talk to her. 
I have a question. And so feel free to reach out and be like, I was on the screen at IIED and, and or the CBA 14. And now I have a question. And Sarah, because, could, um, I, could I ask yeah. you just a question? And yes, how yes. do you pair uh, the projects? So mm -hmm. like the, for the bilateral uh, mm -hmm. part. So we look at a few factors. We look at size. Um, if we have 30 kids from Australia and two from Estonia, I don't want to overwhelm. And so we look at size, we look at age, we look at um, language familiarity. So we don't want um, students to ma be made to feel awkward um, too much by their language barriers, but we also want to challenge kids. This is, this is a multi cross-cultural project. You should have to struggle sometimes with language and understanding people. That's, that's part of the richness. Um, but we look at age um, and we look at um, if, if a school is joining because they, they want to work on their English and climate change is the lens through which they're doing through, they have much different motivation than a school that is joined as a climate change group who is looking as, as that is their way to English. You know, they're the, sort of the two different approaches. And so we really look at all sorts of different factors as we make the pairs and then time zones. So it's not sometimes, uh, it's, we would, though we would love to pair Taiwan and Bolivia, the, the time zone is very challenging. So we look at, oh my goodness, you should see my spreadsheet. It's just like <laughs> craziness. <laughs> can you choose, like, not that you choose the group, but can you choose the topic? Yes. So each country chooses what they're, we propose to help, especially right now with COVID, educators are overwhelmed. And so we propose climate change um, case studies in their country. But again, many will be like, actually the local waterways are very, we are experiencing this runoff from this industry and we'd like to focus on this topic. And then that's what they do. So each country chooses their own issue and their own action. So there's no way I could ever speak for another country and say what action they need to take. That's completely antithetical to the entire project. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Just like my project at the moment, um, I work, it's actually pairing with Tanzania. So it's Irish youth working with Tanzanian uh, youth on, um, uh, it's like accountability uh, in mm -hmm. relation to uh, climate change policies. So it's Wonderful. young people checking, you know, if the policy are actually on the local level are happening or not happening and that kind of thing. But it would be nice to open up apart from the two continents, you know, mm -hmm. to, to reach other, you know, uh, young people from other continents and see what's happening there. Um, mm -hmm. so that could be even what you're doing is so almost already in line with, with what we do. Like it's, it's very much, I mean, we have lots of other components and probably many more months, but, um, but to even just bring into the fold what you're doing already, I mean, we would love, we don't have a Tanzania, we had uh, tried to go through to Tanzania last year, but had some difficulties making the connection, but we don't have an Irish school. I mean, I would love to involve. Yeah. It's a youth group, so it's oh, not. Cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not I think group, in but... school, I'm a teacher by, by, by training. And so my framework is often the language of schools. Yeah. But yeah. But it's, um, it's probably youth groups, um, like, you know, they are, you know, organized, so it's like informal education. Mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, not more, it's more non-formal education. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, even if it's not in school, actually will give you more the space to do all the activities because schools mm -hmm. at least here are very focused on um, curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So this that's, yeah. uh, exactly. So the, the youth projects have this, you know, the ability to, to do more things, in, you know, different from curriculum based like. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would love to connect and see where the intersections might be. That would be so amazing. Definitely, I will, you know, send you uh, an email so we can, you Perfect. know, maybe speak we can have a chat. There. Yes, thanks. Wonderful. Yay. See, this is already mm -hmm. a success. <laughs> <laughs> um, contact email. Yeah, I'll write it again. I think I've written it a few times, but it keeps in the chat moves so fast, right? So, dglobal.org. Hopefully, I haven't misspelled. So, Rosanna uh, or um, Olivia, there is my email. Reach out. Uh, I mean, we would love to hear from anyone. Oh, questions, comments. Sarah, you talk so fast. I got that one all the time as a teacher. Oh, my goodness. There's just a lot to say and not very much time to say it. So I have to say it all quickly. <laughs> Oh, is my email not showing up? In the, oh, I sent it privately to Eliza by mistake. I am so sorry. Here, let me put it in the, the send to everyone. 
I use Zoom all the time and see, I use it pretty much daily and yet I still make mistakes. So there we are. My, sorry to Eliza, who was, I was uh, privately chatting this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for like last question. Yes, you know, you please. were, uh, you know, when I was talking about tools, um, and yes, you were talking about sharing, you know, RSPs and gloves, um, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. But from a Zoom point of view, from mm. Zoom COVID, you know, like we, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for us, is a new world. Like you know, we were face to face based, but now there is all this. Uh, Zoom issues. Yeah. Um, so what methodology will you use to make it more interactive while you have the face to face through Zoom? Mm -hmm. So yes. you know, so not we... just doing the video, you know, when you are offline, while you are online, like what platform do you think you can use to make it more interesting because it could be a bit boring. Yeah. So we do tend to use the, the breakout sessions. So we break kids into small groups. We have them working on certain topics, whether they, so through chat, there's the polling. So um, w before polling, there used to be um, a text sort of thing where you would insert a chat and then we'd all check back with, with everyone's passions. And um, so the polling tends to really give you a, a, a temperature gauge on how things are going and keeps kids involved because they're, they're pressing buttons like mad. Um, we sometimes use Slido on the side. So Slido is a free conversational. It's like a chat room, but um, students can vote up and down comments. So they can be like, oh, I'm really concerned about this topic and then vote it up. Uh, sort of like, a, so it got 14 likes and it moves to the top and then we can have a conversation about that. So that's a nice element that runs alongside. Um, what else do we do? uh yeah we'll have students share music so we'll have them like as they're they're doing something we'll we'll ask them to have music in the background to to sort of help articulate their thoughts and their feelings um hmm. we will we encourage them to do virtual backgrounds so like what's your favorite you know and with kids especially you have to engage them at a different level right there has to be multiple things going on so like what's your favorite song? Like, can you play us the clip for us? Can it be going in the background while you're presenting? Or, um, or, or they love the virtual background challenge <laughs> where it's like, come up with a virtual background. And yeah. Um, so from like, you know, uh, like for example, if I do face-to-face, -face, we will use a lot of, you know, art-based things like, you know, or using post-it to get their opinion or um, <laughs> using art, you know, to, to express, but mm -hmm. Zoom, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I'm trying to find ways to engage, uh, you know, in that way, you know, where mm -hmm. instead of asking you, oh, what's your opinion like? Because yeah. then it's like, oh, maybe you can write on a post it and you put it there, like, you know, how to mm. make that. Have you, you can also use Google Slides. So I'll open a, a common Google Slides and I'll share the link in the chat. And then they all log on to that. And then we do the post-its. So they, but instead they, because there's a feature where you can make like a text box, right? And they choose a color and then they write. So in the, in the center, I'll have like, like a concept map, right? So it'll yeah. be like our feelings on this. And then people are working on the Google slide at the same time that we're in the Zoom conference. Okay. And so you can check back and forth. And so having those, I find the Google suite where they can collaboratively work at the same time to be very good for that. And so, you. or you can have um, the same, they, they have the, the Google design, and so they can be drawing at the same time and doing collaborative artwork, like a, like a graffiti wall. That's the word, graffiti wall, at the same time that you're having your conference. So there's cool sort of collaborative tools like that. Yeah, exactly. Just to make it more, you know, yeah. interesting. Awesome. And then it looks like um, Karen shared uh, a resource here as well. I'm going to open it because I'm always into collaborative resources, but it's in the chat. Karen shared something for you as well. Oh, someone's just admitted. Oh, Rachel, she missed the whole thing. <laughs> but the, if you're just coming in, um, uh, th there is a recording. And I think uh, the CBA people will distribute the links and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure there's a, a whole resource somewhere. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, all the all the sessions are recorded and will mm -hmm. be posted in uh, in the sessions uh, in in the chat. So within it will, yeah, w within twenty four hours to thirty six hours maximum. But 
Perfect. Wonderful. I should have done a big slide just with my email <laughs> because the people in the chat. Anyways, it's so it's Sarah at takingitglobal.org. That's me. Or just Google, uh, Google Center for Global Education. Again, I'd love to chat with anyone. I am always on email. Well, that's the nature of our work, right? Is we're working in these globals. I have a video conference at two in the morning because that's when Kenya is available. So I'm always available and happy to help. And that's me and my Skillshare. <laughs> Thank you to CBA4 and IED for, for hosting this. It's been amazing. Um, and I just really welcome the opportunity to share our, our framework as, a, as something that everyone could potentially take on. Yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you, Sarah, and your passion and your enthusiasm is so truly wonderful. So, <laughs> you know, I've really also really like everybody else really enjoyed listening to you and I, I also want to learn more and it's really, it's, it's amazing what you do. So, oh, thank you so much. Thank you for doing your Thank you. It was very interesting. Uh, thank you. And everyone send me a school. I expect <laughs> at least 12 schools to come for this. We <laughs> <Good> try. <laughs> I'm totally joking. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, for thank you Sarah. Bye. Bye. <laughs>